was just really compelled to play musical instruments. And when I hit about six or seven, I asked for a piano. And my mum and dad said, you know, are you sure that you're going to take this seriously because this is a big uh, instrument? You're choosing the biggest one first. Are you sure you don't want to try the recorder? And from then went on to play flute when I was about 11. And around the time I'd started piano, I also started doing a lot of theatre. Um, doing, there was just, it was just a local little group that I played with, that we used to do plays and stuff, and it was musical as well, so I did a bit of singing, and I wasn't kind of one of these horrendous little prodigy children who was all singing, all dancing, but it was, it was on a really small scale level. I was kind of just getting really used to performing and really enjoying the buzz of getting on stage and performing to people. I mean, I'd got so into my theatre by the time I was 15, 16, I was like, right, I'm going to be an actress. And, uh, and I got into doing Scottish Youth Theatre, which is the Scottish version of the National Youth Theatre, which is quite a big deal, really. It's a big setup, and it's quite a good way in to getting involved with theatre. And I started doing a few other theatre projects, and I was just becoming quite disenchanted with it and just going, I don't want to turn into someone like this. And, I, you know, it was just, it seemed really pretentious to me. And I'd started writing songs, started writing on piano, and it was just hideous. Richard Clayderman just wrong. So I, I taught myself guitar, and uh, which was kind of ironic, really, because I'd all, had all this classical training and then taught myself guitar and voice. And so I've never, ever had a, a, a guitar or singing lesson, which is, which is good, really. So I had all the theory, but didn't really have any major influence from anyone else when it came to teaching myself what I, myself what I actually do. And then I kind of just, it clicked that I could get on stage and perform and still have this communication with an audience, but actually perform in my own. My mum had seen an advert for uh, a scholarship to an American boarding school. Um, and I just thought, well, I might as well go for it. So I found myself in this surreal meeting in London with about 15 other school kids trying to get this scholarship to America. And I was the only Scottish person there and I'd worn a tartan jacket. <laughs> And I was absolutely mortified, just going, oh my God, I just feel like such a little kind of country bumpkin in my tartan jacket in this meeting. But I got the scholarship and ended up at this phenomenal, I mean, really luxurious uh, boarding school in the States for my last year of school which for my music was incredibly formative because my parents hadn't listened to music. None of my friends were really into music and living in St Andrews, I mean, you're an hour and a half away from any decent venue, so we didn't really see any bands. Um, so going to the States, suddenly I was just hit with this wall of not only music, but people who just were obsessed with it. And everyone in my class, all the, all the kids who I was at school with were just music fanatics and were, you know, plying me with mixed tapes and, you know, introducing me to all this stuff, taking me to festivals. And I saw Susan Vega, 10,000 Maniacs. I went to a Grateful Dead concert, which I think probably changes anybody's life. And, uh, and suddenly it became a totally attainable goal. To me to end up back in St Andrews, obviously, you go to America, you go to London, and then you end up back in your little town. Um, but really, I hadn't met any any other bunch of people that excited me more creatively than that lot. So I went back, and I was um, I was uh, I went out with one of the Fence Collective, Pip Dylan, for a couple of years, and we just lived in a house with a dog and guitars, and we wrote and gigged, and it was difficult. You know, it was very frugal. We didn't have any money, but. Looking back, it was a very, very happy existence. It was, it was a one. Up until I was 27, I was kind of pretty happy, to be honest, in Scotland, playing and gigging. Um, and I was kind of determined to do it independently. I think if you're a struggling musician, it's easy to think that, you know, the music industry is this big evil entity that stops you, uh, stops to you being creative and actually just makes it commercial. That's how it can look as, as a musician living somewhere like St Andrews and I got to the point where I'd exhausted every avenue to try and get some financial support to do what I wanted to do in Scotland I just could not get arrested it was impossible to get any support at all I had a great mentor a guy called Bobby Heatley up in Edinburgh who runs Colour Sound which is like a rehearsal studio space and he would just lecture me about how he thought I should do it and he would you know help it just helped me enormously with just lending me equipment to record, giving me free rehearsal time with the band. And um, it was really him who said, you should try and get some publishing, try and get a publishing deal, because 
for those who don't know, it's if you write your own material and you sing, you're treated as two separate things. You're a writer and a performer. So as a performer, it's everything you associate with having a record deal. And you also get your publishing deal if you write and they basically help you get your music used for film and collect your money from wherever it's played. But it's a great avenue now to go down publishing first because record companies tend to limit the amount of development time you're allowed. They really kind of, you'll sign the deal and then they want a record out and then they want you to get going. And by signing my publishing first, I mean, it gave me almost two years to really write, meet people, meet musicians. So I met some incredible session musicians who became incredibly good friends who are now the band. Uh, and really gave me the time to work out what I wanted, which I actually discovered was totally different from what I thought. And then when I was sort of speaking to other labels, all I was getting was, sorry, love, you're the wrong side of 25. You're too old. We're not interested. And it was really shocking. I was really surprised that that was the, that was the attitude. It's just like, so you want a 20-year-old girl to give you singer-songwriter. I mean, there's so few people on the planet who can do that. And I think Bob Dylan, Kate Bush, and possibly Willie Mason, the, the guy who's just come out, I was blown away by his gig. But there's so few people who can be original and be expressive and intelligent at 20. I wasn't being, I wasn't being original at 20. But all the time, my record company, Relentless, had, we'd kind of met them a while before that, me and my manager. And they just always been there in the background, just saying, if you want to sign to us, we're here, we love you. So sign the deal, which was, you know, it's a big decision and it wasn't always easy um, going through that process because I'd been independent for so long and not signed. Um, but as, as you can see, it's gone, it's gone brilliantly, yeah. There was no pressure for material for the album. I mean, there's about 20 songs that I was happy to put on an album to choose from. Um, and so really it was just down to getting the right producer and the record company just laid out 15 CVs and said, who should we call? And I read through them and Steve's, Steve Osborne, who produced the record, his CV just really stuck out because, A, because he'd just done a lot of male rock. He'd done U2, Placebo, Happy Mondays, Doves, Elbow. And to me, it was a list of great, great music. and. It was also what he hadn't done. He hadn't done any really bad female pop, um, which there's a lot of. <laughs> and I just didn't even want that to be an option. And as soon as I met Steve, it was just great. We just hit it off straight away. Well, when we came to record the album, I was pretty adamant that I didn't want to record it in a big swanky studio, which was quite good, really, because we couldn't have afforded that anyway. And uh, Steve had a friend called Nick who... Um, has a house out in Bradford-upon-Avon, just outside Bath in England. And uh, it's a beautiful little cottage in the woods in the middle of nowhere. And the guy has um, extended his house, basically turned it into this little studio. And it's so gnarly. It's, there's no frills at all. And, uh, you know, really, really basic, but an incredible atmosphere. Just really very characterful. Steve and I had made this incredibly raw bedroom record. I mean, it sounded like it was made in that studio. Um, and it was it was really very, very basic. And um, the record company heard it and they said, you know, well, it's, it's great, but it's going to be really difficult to get it on the radio because it's so stripped down. And obviously, you know, when you make an album, you feel like you've got a baby, at what I can imagine. That's what it feels like. You're just like, don't touch the baby. <laughs> and they said, listen, let us get someone to mix it, to make it sound a little bit lusher and a little bit fuller. And it'll be a much more, a much easier job for us to get it on the radio. And I was just like, oh God, what's going to happen? So it got mixed by a guy called Ren Swan. And obviously I was, it was a horrible time for me. I was just so worried about how, what was going to come back and um, came back and it just sounded amazing. It just sounded, it sounded more expensive for sure. And uh, it still had this, this kind of edge that I was trying to achieve, but then it just had this real extra level as well, especially with my vocals. It's suddenly just one of those freaky nights where I got a call 24 hours before the show, Naz the rapper had pulled out 
and they said can you come and do it and I was like um yeah okay <laughs> so went down I mean I was I was actually playing keyboards in a friend's band on tour so I was on a tour bus down to London had a wash in a cab down to BBC Studios and suddenly I'm sitting there watching The Cure going oh my god I think I'm on next and because the band couldn't come because it was such late notice which was kind of really serendipitous because it was a real band show that night and so I guess I stuck out a bit so it was just me and my little pedal and I just bashed the guitar got my leaps going did the song and I'd been doing this and I mean eight nine months ago I was doing that song in coffee shops in Scotland to six or seven people literally and so to me it was just like people have been drinking their cappuccinos going yeah that's all right and now I'm doing it on a TV show it was just normal for me I was just doing what I'd always done you know and okay it was live telly so I was nervous and I didn't want to I didn't want to go wrong but I it wasn't prepared for how people reacted to that there was like an internet vote afterwards and it was the cure Anita Baker Jackson Brown the future heads embrace and me and I got like over 50% of the vote for this program which was totally I'm so relieved that um that I'm this age for I mean I'm th I turned 30 last week and partly it's just like it's a bit like eh, I'm 30 you can do it when you're 30 and I hate this whole kind of attitude that's from the public but also from the music industry that I that I came up against when I was trying to get a deal that you're past it it's just like Sheryl Crow had her first album out when she was 34. There's a living, breathing example of one of the most successful songwriters on the planet who didn't have an album till she was 34. So why the attitude, you know? And so that, I, I feel really good. I feel like I'm flying a flag a little bit for, for older female musicians. Now I'm on tour, I'm singing every night. I know that I can't stay up till six in the morning and just get completely mashed, you know? I've, otherwise I'm not gonna be able to sing next week. And so in that respect, I suppose, I'm more, I take it a bit more seriously, I think, because my priorities are sorted out. And thankfully I've had 10 years of partying with my mates, so I'm sort of, I can, you know, I feel like I can move on to something else. Really excited about making the second record. I'd love to work with Steve again. Um, I really feel like we kind of opened the door to something and we didn't, you know, I think there was more to explore with where we went. And um, thankfully, I'm just, I'm still writing, it's still pretty prolific. And I've, there was a lot of songs that I couldn't get on the first album. I could put out a second album now, I've got enough songs, but I do want to put some new material on it. But um, yeah, I'm just excited to sort of, to get to the next level, because I really feel that since we've been touring the album, the style of what I've, what I'm doing is really solidifying and finding its feet and, um, you know, I can feel the songs maturing. I mean, I've learned so much over the last year about how I want to make a record, how I think a live show should sound, how instruments sound together and what I like about that and what I don't like about that. Um, and really I've always dreamt of doing all these different projects of working with digital stuff that I do I do still sort of love um maybe doing I'd love to write music for film I'd love to write instrumental music and I'd love to do some totally stripped down acoustic stuff so there's a lot I want to do but I know that through the middle of all that there'll always be this thing that Eye to the Telescope has started which is my songs done I would think in a pretty traditional way, because I think that's an incredibly powerful way of presenting songs with great musicians and just approaching it really honestly and just trying.